my wife is the one that misses out. She has some issues with continuing education that she's got to do, and she said to greet everyone and hope to be here in a couple of years. The topic for today is the issue of maximum security. You know, as we think about, about being eternally secure in Christ Jesus, we, we understand that the better we understand what preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery is, is the better that we can rest complete in what Christ accomplished for us. Those who have trouble with uh, understanding what it means to be eternally secure in Christ Jesus are often confused by, by what they learn from religion and denominationalism. And, uh, and they put the emphasis, uh, uh, indirectly, they put the emphasis back on the believer to remain in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So we come to what it boils down to is it, it turns out to be an identity issue. And people who are confused and uncertain, you know, my heart goes out to them. My heart goes out to them because here they are, they're, 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 they're wanting to be in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ where they can feel secure and they can feel safe, and yet they, they are uh, worshiping or fellowshipping, I should say, in an environment that doesn't, doesn't produce that. So we want to come to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8. And we're going to... We're going to read verses 28 through 39. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 39. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for another wonderful day of grace, and we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. And as we do so, we pray that we'll study in light of the new creature that you created us to be, that we'll pray, that we'll study in a way that certainly lifts up and honors and glorifies your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. You know, as I read Paul's, uh, Paul's writings and Paul's passages of Scripture, many times when I get to a certain passage of Scripture, I'm thinking, what was it like for the Romans to be reading this passage of Scripture? Or the Ephesians or the Philippians? And we get to a place like this, and we read these last two verses. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of, of God, which is in Christ Jesus the Lord. I just wonder how big was the standing ovation, was the clapping of the hands, was the jumping up and down and saying, praise God and amen. I wish sometimes we would get the same kind. Now, my heart does that. But, you know, my body, I don't always let my body show such an appreciation for them. But, you know, and perhaps it's because we've studied this for so many years that perhaps we begin to take it for granted and we begin to not realize the impact that it had. But when the Romans were reading this, to find out how secure that they were in Christ. Pastor, uh, Pastor Jordan, Pastor Ricky says this, this is maximum security. And the reason why it's maximum security is because it rests in an unbeatable, undeniable uh, location. It, it comes to us based on what the Lord Jesus Christ himself did. You know, as we, as we come to this point in, the, in the Romans chapter 8, the thrust of Romans chapter 8 has been the issue of walking in the Spirit. Look at chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 8. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. There's going to be this issue that is going to come as, as, as we begin to learn more about the, the relationship and the ministry of the Holy Spirit and how he ministers to believers. 
He ministers to the believers. He empowers believers. But he is going to be the basis of our understanding, which is going to be built upon that. It's going to be built upon the entire Godhead. As Paul's going to prove in chapter 8, that we are secure in Christ. He says, for, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And that law of, of sin, uh, we've been set free. Do you, you like freedom? <laughs> I love being free. I tell you, uh, I usually go when I see a crowd and get to preach in a crowd this size, it's usually because people are incarcerated. Uh, you know, and uh, so to be able to stand before this many free men, this is something else to be able to preach for that. Uh, actually, our jail ministry has been in the past, but I mean, that was some of the biggest crowds we ever had were, were in jails and, and prisons. But we come and we preach, and, and being free, I tell you, you talk to a bunch of people in jail about the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free. Boy, they understood, and they, they, they really appreciated the doctrine of freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. But therefore, now in the dispensation of grace, we are free to walk in the Spirit. See, that's a great blessing. That's a great opportunity that we have as we, as we come in and, uh, and be able to identify our life in Christ Jesus. That's not all the Holy Spirit does for us because we learn in this chapter He's going to help our infirmities. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You know, when we think about what are, what are our infirmities, well, there's a whole denominational structure out there today that thinks that the, the infirmities here are that, you're, that you're, uh, your back's out or, your, or whatever it could be, some sort of physical infirmity. But that's not what our infirmity is. That's not what Romans chapter 8 is talking about. Romans chapter 8 is all, all about being left here in these as yet unredeemed bodies. It says for, the, for creation, come up to um, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 8 verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. We could probably all get a unanimous vote here about who would like to have their, unanimous bo- their uh, glorified body today. But here we're talking about these are the infirmities that the Holy Spirit is, is helping today. He is helping with the infirmities of living in these as yet unredeemed bodies. He is going to be able to help us overcome the, the temptation of the struggle of our flesh. And yet, uh, it, during all that, to, for us to remain confident and eternally secure, secure, if you will, in what God is doing today in the dispensation of grace. You know, when we think about what God and the Holy Spirit is doing, we would say, why would God do that? Why would God give us this ministry? Why would God give us this, this hope and this expectation of being eternally secure? Because when we trusted Christ as our Savior, instead of God giving us our glorified bodies, He gave us the Holy Spirit. And He says, this is a magnificent opportunity for you to be able to identify with the absolute ministry and power of God as we live life in, in the flesh, if you will. He gave us the Holy Spirit. And because we are in the flesh, He's given the Holy Spirit to help our infirmities nonetheless. But you know, when it comes here in verse, He says in, uh, in uh, we're thinking about, the, about the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, verse 26, or in verse 27, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You know what God's will is? God's will is for us to to yield and to take advantage of the power of the Holy Spirit. But we're going to see how God is going to take active involvement on where we spend eternity. Here in verse 27, we're going to take a great big turn. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession with saints according to the will of God. In verse 27, the subject's not going to be just the ministry of the Holy Spirit anymore. The focus is going to be on God and His will and His, His purpose. You know, people want to know, what is God's will for my life? Well, you know, God has, a, God has His own will for our life. And we want to identify with this so that we know and can see how things are going. 
And so he says in verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. I was glad as Right Division came along and started to finally kind of, kind of fill in the cracks and start to take over some of my thinking. Because for many years, we were, we were taught to look at the life as if it was just a, like a bed of roses, you know, that, that the low, rose-colored glasses. And we were, we were looking at things that weren't good, and we're trying to pretend that they were good. And so we're glad we're beyond that. It says all things work together for good. And I'm glad to know that when bad things happen to good people, that that's not really what God's will is. God's will, you know, that's, that's the effect of living in a sin-cursed world. But God has a plan that will see people, see believers through that. And we know that in the end, that, uh, that, that what God's will is. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And I'm great, gratefully thankful that there's nothing that I can do. There's nothing that walking according to the course of, uh, of this world, according to the prince, the power of the air, the spirit, that now worketh in children of disobedience. When my actions and my life and my attitudes begin to identify wrongly with Satan's plan and policy, that God has a way of turning it around for his good. And in the end you know, God will be glorified, and I praise him for, for that. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. You know, the reason why God can do that is because we're saints today. I was having a conversation, it seems like it comes up more, more frequently, you know, certain things kind of cycle around, but, but to be identified as a saint. Now, it sounds great, and we've, we've probably at some point in time all done it. You know, we've, we, we've identified ourselves to people, well, I'm just a saint saved by grace. I'm just a sinner. I'm sorry, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And, you know, that just, that just really doesn't get it, does it? Because that is not who I am anymore. And the more we can purge our thinking about who we aren't and, and start to focus on who we really are, then we can begin to correct our thinking and correct that stuff that goes on in the back of our mind which is just stuff we do naturally. We want to be purposeful in the way we think. And so God doesn't identify us. He doesn't look at us and say, there, there's, an old, there's another one of them sinners saved by grace. And when God sees us, he says, these people are just saints of the Most High God. These are people who are identified with my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're saints. And we are, of course, the ones who are called according to his purpose. And, of course, God, according to his purpose is, it is that uh, these things become a reality in our life. And the things that's going to become a reality in our life is, is this, beginning in verse 28 again. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. You know, these are all actions that are taken by God towards the believer. These are actions and attitudes. And this is God's will and this is God's purpose and God's design for the believer is that the believer would walk in, in understanding this. Now, this is where the believer would walk in, in uh, recognizing all that God has done for us. Once again, as we compare the, the message, if you will, as, as we compare the message to, the, to what you learn in religion or we learn in denominationalism, you know, so often they don't, they, don't, uh, they don't teach and have believers focus their mind on the finished work of Christ at Calvary. They have us focus our mind and attention on what we can do, and it's, it's like we haven't been justified. It's like we haven't been called, that we haven't been glorified. But when we think about these are actions and activities and, that God has directed toward us, and every single one of them is finished. God doesn't need to do anything else. What do we need to do? We need to become in, in the place where we can begin to live our life in light of these truths. So if we take and tie all these things together we can see why we're secure in our salvation. We can see why we're secure in just believing that Christ died on the cross for our sins. Because the moment we did all that, and the moment we did that, God did all this for us. We are secure because of the things that God not only initiated, but that he also completed. 
You know, simply, and, and the reason, simply based on our positive response to believing that Christ died on the cross for our sins. Many people just can't get over the fact that that's all somebody needs to do. All one needs to do is just simply believe that they need a Savior, so therefore what they need to do is believe that Christ died on the cross for their sins. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So it doesn't take much for me to realize that I certainly didn't live up to God's glory. I was no example of God's glory. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I love the way Paul just, you know, every time he puts out this expectation, he says, but don't get too far away from where our hope really rests. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. There's not a period there. It's through Jesus Christ our Lord. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. Paul says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. You know, I just, I, we, of course, that's the gospel. <laughs> that's what, what someone believes. And Paul said, I delivered unto you, first of all, that, how that Christ died for our sins. You know, when we, rec- when we realize the wages of sin is death, there's only one thing that pays for death, it's going to be I'm one pain that pays for sin, and that is death. And, but it takes the death of a righteous man. It takes one who qualifies. And that's why Christ can and indeed did die for our sins. And it's all an action and activity of God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, God says, I've got, a, I've got a foolproof plan. And it's something that if I wanted help from mankind, it would be something that they would surely uh, foul up. It would be something that they surely couldn't do. And so if I am going to guarantee eternal life, if I'm going to be able to promise someone eternal life, it is going to have to be based on something that is absolutely infallible, and that would be the life of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. But to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. God says, I will take the faith of those who will believe. He says, I will take that. The one who, who has enough faith has the faith that he can, he can quit working for his salvation. He can cease from work. He can cease from good deeds and that he will just believe that Christ died for his sins, he says, I will give that person eternal life. Come back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 38. I'm, I'm 28 through 30. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 through 30. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Activities of God. Verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? I tell you, what a, what, a, what a way to be able to view life. Because truthfully, we look around at some of the, the circumstances and details of, uh, going on around us. It, it may not look like things are really going to be all that good, isn't it? But if, all, if, if God be for us, who can be against us? I say it doesn't matter. Because God's going to be the victor in this, in this, in this program. God's going to be this. If, what should we say? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You know, when the Lord Jesus Christ went to Calvary to pay the price for our sins, 
This was an activity that God, this is what God initiated. This is what God did. And this is, this is what, what our eternal security is going to be based on. It's not going to be based on me. It's not going to be based on you. But it's going to be based on the faithful and finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in, if God be for us, who can be against us? When we think about what was the hard part in all this? The hard part was for God to give, uh, to, to send his son to Calvary. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. Speaking of, of God now, it says, For he, that's God, hath made him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That was the hard part. The hard part was that he made his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. That was not an easy thing to do. It wasn't an easy thing for God the Father to do, and it wasn't an easy thing for, for the Lord Jesus Christ to, to uh, participate in. As he was going there on the night that he was going to be crucified in the Garden of Gethsemane, he sits down, he prays, and he says, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Well, it wasn't possible, was it? Because this had to be done. The wages of sin is death. And death had to be paid for by a righteous man. And that is the only one that qualified would be the Lord Jesus Christ. God says, I will take my son and I will make him to be sin for us. Be sin for me. Be sin for you. Because that is the only way. That is the, that we might, the only way possible, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. Uh, that it would that it had to be. And you know, the moment a person trusts the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, and and no longer do we we find ourselves to come short of the glory of God. Because now we've been made the righteousness of God in Him, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're not going to come short of the righteousness of, of uh, of God's glory anymore. It's an impossibility because of the new creature that He created us to be in, in Christ Jesus. So God made his son to be sin for us who knew no sin. This was done one time. It was once for all. It will never happen again. It was an absolutely complete and perfect sacrifice. And God will never put his son in a position that he'll ever need to be judged and punished again. He'll never do it. It's just not going to happen. So we recognize this and we see this. So therefore, come back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 32 and first part of 33. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? We are the elect if you trusted Christ as your Savior. Who's going to bring a charge against the believer? Well, we read down through the passage, and we know there's only one person that would ever try to do that, only one being that would ever want to, to break the provision and the, the, the victory that uh, was afforded us at Calvary, and that would be Satan. And Satan, his plan and policy. Satan has still access to God as he roams the universe, kind of giving account of himself as we learned in the book of Job. But he's going to one that's going to want to break the power of what it is. But Satan is not the one. He's not the sovereign one. God is the sovereign one. And it says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. See, it's nobody else. The terms and conditions of our justification are clearly set forth, and it was all according to God's plan and design, which included his son going to Calvary to pay the price for our sins. So who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Well, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercessions for us. So you know who's not making, who's not bringing charges against God's elect? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's not bringing charges. He's interceding for the, for the, on behalf of the believer. So he's not going to want to be doing it. But, but what clearly, if who would be qualified to bring a charge against one of God's elect? Well, it would be the one who paid the price. 
he would be the one that says, no, I'm not going to cover that one. But, but he's not there bringing charges against the believer. He would be there making intercession for, for the believer. Christ is not condemning us. He's not in, up in heaven with a great big old blackboard or whatever it would be in today's technology. And every time we sin, he write that one down. Every time we confess our sin, he is, he is erasing it, writing it down, erasing it. He said, man, this is the fourth time I put that on the board today. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> You know, but we have absolute forgiveness, so there's there's none of that, and and so we recognize that that he is interceding in that behalf. Well, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? It's interesting. He asks who, and then he gives us descriptions of some what's. <laughs> you know, who shall? And you know, the truth is. And, and uh, perhaps Satan is well aware of this now, that he can't separate us from the love of Christ. But he can make the believer think that he's separated. If we put our mind and our focus on the things that are going on around us, then it's going to be, you know, pretty soon someone, someone's going to think, I think God's upset with me. And is he? No. He's not upset with you because he puts you in the safest place possible where you could never be contaminated again he put us in his son the lord jesus christ so what's going to what's going to separate us from the love of christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written for thy sake we are killed all the day long we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter so what the As the Lord Jesus Christ is interceding on our behalf, he is just over and over, you know, maybe this is metaphorically, I don't know how this is really going on, but I do know that the basis of our relationship with God is based on forgiveness. Come to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. It says that we should be to the praise of the glory of His grace, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, what does it do once we have believed? Look at verses 6 and 7. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. You know, every time I read that we have forgiveness, and we understand that the forgiveness is not based on performance, but it's based on value. It was based on the value of the sacrifice. It was based on the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to uh, uh, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We cannot get away from the fact that it was the perfect, sinless Son of, the Lord, uh, of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who paid the price of our sin with His blood. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That's a great place to be. And it's based on what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Look at chapter 2 and verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened us together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So, you know, we are secure. If there was, if there was an, uh, a, an extra charge that could come along after we trusted Christ as our Savior, that the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ did not pay for, where would our security be? It would be gone. It, it would be shattered. It wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be true anymore. Ephesians, I mean, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. So we recognize that we, we've got the entire Godhead involved in this. We've got the, God the Holy Spirit who enables us and empowers us today. 
We've got the activity of God as it's directed towards our status and our standing. And we have the, the, uh, the activity of, of the Lord Jesus Christ as he paid the price for, for our sins. The entire Godhead doing that. And uh, there's no one that has anywhere near that power to break that for us. That's why we have the security that we have. So he says, who, verse 35 through 37, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, you know, we know some things here. All these verses are, uh, all the things and the activities of, of uh, the world are designed to move us away from that position that, uh, that God has given us. Also know that many times in, in a, a religions or denominational setting, that, the, that what's going on there is, is they're taking a setting. It, it, we, we know, according to Ephesians chapter 1, we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so the things that have been freely given to us of God, they're ours. God has already given to us. Performance-based acceptance systems put you in a, in a place where they put you to work to try to earn that which God has already given you. And that creates insecurity and not, not security for sure. You know, what God wants us to do is to recognize that Satan has no power over us. He has no, he has no power to separate us from the love of Christ. He has no power. He doesn't have the power to bring forth circumstances in our life. But if we choose to yield our mind and our thinking to his design and plan, it won't be long before we're going to be possibly questioning, does God really love me? Is he really for me? Because that's what the Bible says, God is, God is for us. You know, and the truth is, you know, life is just hard. And it's not designed, if we're looking on the issues of circumstances, to create that unity and that security that we have in Christ Jesus. I mean, when we look about all that's going on around us, do you know anyone, I mean, other than possibly your family, do you know anyone that has an absolutely perfect life? You know? I'm sure your family does. But how, how many other people do we know? You know, the truth is nobody does. And the reason why it's not because God lacks love for us is not because he lacks the power to put us in a position to where we could have that. That's just not what he's doing today. Instead, he is building uh, life around, er, around so we can have victory under this. Much of religion today, as we say, is designed, if you will, to bring us over about the issues of, of God and his, his circumstances, if you will. Look at Luke chapter 12. You know, we come along in religion today, one of the main thrusts of religion is the issue of health, wealth, and prosperity, and, and all, of these, all of these physical things that go on. And you listen to a message like that, and, and if we're being honest with ourselves, you know, we have to say, you know, God's just really not doing that in my life today. But he has this promise, and we, we think is, well, is health, wealth, and prosperity unscriptural? So, well, no, it's not unscriptural. It's just not dispensational. Look what he says in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 22 through 32. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for your body, what you shall put on. The, uh, the life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the raven, for they neither sow nor reap, neither have they storehouses nor bar barns, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you taking thought can add to his statue one cubit? If ye then be not able to do the thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not, they not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not what ye shall eat, nor what ye shall drink, neither be ye doubtful of doubtful mind. 
For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of them. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I remember the last time I heard this passage preached from a denominational preacher. It was a, it was a good message. I was, I, was, I was wishing it was true. But, you know, you kind of find out, you know, it wasn't going to be true. But you know what he did? He stopped right there. He says, he stopped right there. It is, if you're not a little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Then he did not go on to this. Sell all sell that you have and, and give alms. Provide yourselves uh, with, uh, bags which wax not, a treasure in the heaven that faileth not, where nor thief approaches, neither moth corrupt. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He didn't do that part. But that's unfair to the context. It was true for the little flock. It was true for the kingdom saint. In God, the promise under the kingdom, the, the promise under the kingdom is God would provide their physical need. The apostle Paul tells us, if you don't work, you don't eat. It's not that, uh, that give us this day our daily bread because that's not God's program for today. Of course, there's going to be the program in, in time past. Today in the day, dispensation of grace, God's not against health. In the dispensation of grace, he's not against wealth. But it does not mean because someone has health and you don't that God loves that person more. Or because someone else has more physical, material things that God loves them more than he would love, love you. And it doesn't mean that God has shown others more favor. And how do we know that for sure? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. I love these little short verses. I can memorize them. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. That's a great blessing. That's a great promise. If we walk by sight, if we walk in light of what we see going on around us, you know, it's going to be difficult for us to keep our mind and off the circumstances of, of what's going on. But God's love for us is not tied to our health. God's love for us is not tied to our wealth. God's love for us is not tied to how well our marriage is going. It does, it's not tied to how much we, we give monetarily to him. God's love for us is tied to our relationship with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we walk by faith, with faith and not by sight. His love for us is not contingent upon uh, performance. And when people suffer from hurricanes and tornadoes and wildfires and tsunamis and, and this, it's not because God doesn't love them. It's simply because we're living in a sin-cursed world. You know that God is not punishing you at all? He's not taking anybody out behind the, the spiritual woodshed and giving them a whooping. He's not doing any of that today. And the reason is because for him to, to submit the believer to that, it would be the same as submitting his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to that. So come with me to, to if you will, to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. When we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, the blessings that we have come because we are in him. We are in the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether it be Jew or Gentile, whether it be bond or free, and have, all, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So, you know, the significance of being baptized into the body of Christ is tremendous. It's something that I don't know that I really have the, the, the mind to, to understand and to grasp exactly what that means. Because when we think about what it means, we read Ephesians 5 and verse 30. Look at Ephesians 5 and verse 30. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 30 says, For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. Members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So when we got baptized into Christ, at that point in time, our positional identification with the Lord Jesus Christ was we became members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. 
and we trusted Christ as our Savior, that's the position that we've got. That's where God sees us today. And Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32 says that uh, God forgave us all trespasses. He forgave us for Christ's sake. You know, we said earlier that, that when Christ went to Calvary, when, when Christ went to Calvary, when God made him to be sin for us, when Christ knew no sin, and the reason why he did it, it's a one-time thing. Because now the payment is complete, it is over, it's done, nothing can be done. So if God did not forgive us of all trespasses, and we are in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, if God was going to punish us, there's no way for him to do it without punishing his Son. And once again, those days are over. There will never be another judicial act of God the Father against his Son, our Savior. And because of that, there will not be one judicial act of judgment against anyone who has trusted Christ as their Savior, anyone that God the Holy Spirit has taken and baptized into the, the, the body of Christ, no one who is a member of the Lord Jesus Christ's body, of his flesh and of his bones, will ever have to fear God's judgment being poured out against them. Not because of me. It's that God says, I will not do that to my son again. That's done. That's over. So when it comes to the issue of eternal security, it's because of what Christ accomplished for us at Calvary. Come back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. This is talking about distress and famine and naked, about even about death. In verse 37, it says, Nay, in all these things, verse 37, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You know, I, 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 I trust, you know, probably every time I look at this passage of Scripture, I do wonder what does it mean to be more than a conqueror. And I said, well, how can you be more than a conqueror? But when I thought about, you know, when wars come out and, 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 and perhaps nations fight, one wins and one loses. One is a conqueror and one has been conquered. It's not perfect. You know, there are always things that, that aren't, aren't exactly settled. I mean, we may have defeat, one may have defeated the other one, but it, they're not, you know what it is to be more than a conqueror? Our relationship today with God based on the finished work of His Son, Lord Jesus Christ, is we're not just a conqueror. We're more than just a conqueror because his work is absolute. His work is perfect. That's why Paul can say, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. There's nothing else to be done. No way to improve on it. We're not just conquerors. We're more than conquerors. Through him that loved us. So Paul comes to this conclusion. Verse 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, when we think about that, that's maximum security. That's eternal security because it's a contract and it was uh, issues performed for, by the entire Godhead for our benefit. And God says, according to he wrote through the Apostle Paul, there is nothing, no one who will ever have any impact on where we'll spend eternity. And we praise God for that. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the fact that uh, you willingly sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you, were, you spared nothing, not even your son. We're thankful for his willingness to go and to pay that price. We thank you and are grateful for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. May we remember to keep our eyes and our focus and our attention on our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, and the hope that we have of eternal life based on his finished work at Calvary. We ask and pray this in the name of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, and for his sake.